Hey, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And today we're going to talk about sensors in the Myers-Briggs system. Now we've been going through a series of podcasts that focus on each Myers-Briggs type. And we started with the eight intuitive types. And starting next week or next podcast, we're going to start focusing on the eight sensor types. But before we did that, we felt like it was the right time to do a podcast about sensors in general. And this is because in part, we focus a lot on intuitives at Personality Hacker. It's part of our BHAG, our big, hairy, audacious goal is to provide resources for intuitives, to spark an intuitive awakening, which we've talked about in previous podcasts. So we here at Personality Hacker focus a lot on the eight intuitive types. And that's, again, that's part of our major mission. But we've noticed that online Myers-Briggs communities have a tendency to be not so friendly towards the sensor types. And you see this reflected in a lot of feedback. Like, why aren't people talking about sensors? Like, why aren't people talking about my personality type? You won't see this so much in certified MBTI circles. In fact, I would say that they have a tendency to downplay the intuitive sensor split. It's just one more dichotomy. But the clear stratification between people who have intuition as their primary perceiving process or sensing as their primary perceiving process, you can see that this is majorly important to the individuals who discover their intuitives. Because one of the first thing that happens, one of the first things that happens is that they end up marginalizing people who are sensors. This is very common behavior. Somebody will discover their intuitive. They may feel like they've been at the receiving end of a lot of negativity from a sensor world. This feeling of disenfranchisement ends up creating a sort of rebellious or knee-jerk response to then wanting to marginalize the other side, the side that they see maybe has you know, harmed them or been a bit of a villain in their life, in their minds. And so we feel like that perception is, it's an understandable first response. And we feel like it's massively important that, especially us as intuitives, that we graduate beyond it. So what we wanted to do in this podcast is we wanted to throw a little bit of love to sensors. We wanted to explain how sensing processes work. We wanna talk about how important they are in general, as part of the social ecosystem or the personality type ecosystem. And we want to talk about how important they are in the goal of intuitive awakening, because they're just as important to be on board with intuitive awakening as intuitives are. Yeah. And if you're a new listener, we actually have recorded multiple podcasts on intuition specifically, where we break down the difference between extroverted intuition, introverted intuition, what is intuition, what's the percentage in population. We, we talk about a lot of this intuitive stuff. So you can go on our website and search intuition or intuitive, and there's a bunch of recordings that will come up, you know, previous podcasts that you can listen to about intuition and really get an understanding of intuition and what we talk about around intuition. As we talk about sensors and intuitives, we're talking about a 75 to 25% split. So 75% of the population uses sensing to learn information and perceive the world. Now, only about 25% of the population uses intuition. We like to use the example of right-handed people versus left-handed people. You know, the world is designed for the majority. So as a sensor, if you're a sensor listening, most of the world, at least institutionally, is designed for you and the way that you live your life. And intuitives just like left-handed people living in a right-handed world have to adjust to accommodate the majority of people are right-handed, right? So as an intuitive, we're moving through the world and we have to adjust to the infrastructure and the systems that are set up for the majority, which are sensors, meaning that you have a, a sensing process of how you learn information in the world, how you perceive the world. You either do that through something called extroverted sensing or something called introverted sensing. This is how you show up to the world. Now, I grew up in a household, my both my parents and my brother are all left-handed. So I was the only right-handed person in my house. So it's, it's a great metaphor for uh, 75% of my house was actually the reverse <laughs> of what the more, the normal world is, I was the oddball out being the right-handed person in, in the house. So interestingly enough, I had to adapt to all these left-handed people around me. Now, Antonio, you grew up in a predominantly right-handed house. You never thought about left-handed people ever, right? Not really, no. I mean, my, my dad is a bit ambidextrous, but other than that, 
yeah, I've, I never spend time thinking about left-handed people unless it comes up specifically, like unless my attention is drawn to it for some specific reason. I, I mean, I never think, oh, this person is left-handed. Will they be able to use my can opener or will they be able <laughs> yeah. to use my scissors? Like it's, it just doesn't even hit my radar. I'm guessing if you lived with a left-handed person though, you, that would be on your radar. So as a sensor going through the world, you aren't really probably thinking about intuitives most days because unless you live with an intuitive, unless you have intuitives in your life, you're going through life just doing your thing. And I mean, that's that's normal. That's natural. I think that's a, a normal, natural thing for us to go through life unaware of other people unless we're made aware of them. And again, I'd encourage you to go listen to some of the intuitive podcasts if you're more interested on what that actually means to be intuitive specifically. And we really do some deep dives into that. I'm glad you mentioned the left hand, right hand disparity yeah, and likened it to intuitives and sensors, not only because I think it's a really great metaphor for how much we don't really think about the other side unless we're forced to. I think also it's a great way to exemplify how an, an entire infrastructure can be suited to a certain style of person. But that doesn't mean that the infrastructure is suited to the individual. Yeah. So the world is made for right-handed people, but that doesn't mean that every right-handed person feels like the world is made for them. <laughs> Good, great point, yes. And I think for sensors, yeah, we, the world is generally fashioned for by and for the majority. But that doesn't mean that on an individual level, every sensor is going to believe that the world is crafted for them. And so this idea of intuitives feeling disenfranchised and feeling misunderstood and sometimes claiming the monopoly on that as if the rest of the world is just not, you know, it's just not created for them. So therefore, you know, us intuitives are the only ones that really feel profoundly misunderstood. That's not necessarily just an intuitive issue. There are plenty of sensors that can feel on an individual level disenfranchised and on an individual level profoundly misunderstood. Even though they are part of that 75%, and even though they are catered to in many different ways, that doesn't mean that they're always going to feel like the world is crafted for them. And that's an important point for intuitives to remember. If an intuitive is feeling profoundly misunderstood, and they feel like sensors are the ones who are putting them in that position... It's important to remember that this is not a un this is not just an experience that sent, uh, that intuitives go through and that's a part of the bridge being able to recognize that individuals are always going through a unique expression a unique set of experiences remembering that sensors can understand what it feels like to be misunderstood is a part of the bridging of those two worlds that I think is not something that's frequently recognized yeah, I think a really great example of what you're talking about is the school system, at least here in the West. My brother's an ESFP, and I know a lot of ESFP kids who, to sit at a desk and be quiet and learn from a book is very difficult for some, some types. And I would say ESFPs are one of those types. Often, it's not across the board. A lot of ESFPs are great at studying and, and book learning and all this. My brother growing up, you know, he was labeled with with learning disabilities and all this. And, and uh, the more I understand about type as an adult now, I'm going, he didn't have a learning disability. He was just wired differently. He learned by experiential engagement with his outside world, by really getting in touch with the sensational experience of his life. He's just not a book learner. So to say he's got a learning disability, yeah, the style of learning that is popular in the infrastructure, but he would be an outlier and he's a sensor. And his individual unique experience was much different than maybe an ISFJ would be in school, which has a predisposition, in my opinion, to book learning and sitting at a desk and really doing well academically. So I think your point is taken that just because you're a sensor doesn't mean everything in the world is set up for you. You're going to have things that you obviously are outside the norm as well. Absolutely. There are definitely types that feel more misunderstood than other types. And some of those types our sensory types. So why don't we launch into the different styles of sensing, talk a little bit about how the minds are wired a little differently for both the benefit of intuitives that would want to know more about the people in their lives and understand, you know, what what are some of the factors that are informing how infrastructure is set up and how the world is set up. And then also for those of you who are sensors who might not have done a deep dive into the sensory cognitive functions, 
understanding a little bit more about how you're wired and why you show up the way that you do. And again, ways to, you know, give a little bit of love to that and appreciation and understand how important those components are in the social ecosystem. So in the Myers-Briggs system, the sensing component is how we perceive the world. All right. And the intuitive component too. Sensing and intuition inform what are technically called our perceiving cognitive functions. And perception is literally perceiving. It's like things that catch our attention, what we're choosing to look at, what catches our eye, what gets absorbed into us. And we believe that it informs our learning style. Frequently, there is a direct correlation between our perceiving cognitive function and how we learn new information and take it in and understand it. Intuitives, we've already talked about how they favor what we've called advanced pattern recognition. So they want to know what's going on behind the curtain, which is impossible to directly engage with or interact with. And so they pick up a lot of clues about what's going on in front of the curtain in order to make that speculative leap. But sensors are different. They don't actually want to go behind the curtain as much because what's far more interesting to them is what is verifiable and what is reliable. That's so much more interesting. And so in order to get what's verifiable and reliable, they simply have to have a direct interaction with it, a direct connection. That concept of seeing is believing is very much a sensory concept. And so they're using their multiple senses to do this. Now, there's more than five senses. We also have a sense of balance, sense of temperature, sense of, I mean, there's a lot of sense of time, sort of that like weird thing that tells you that you might be five minutes late. Like there's lots of different sensory inputs that we have. We focus on the five primary ones though, because those are the ones that are easiest to understand how we engage with the world. And they tend to be the most interesting to certain styles of sensors. Now, remembering that they want reliable and verifiable information is a foundational component to understanding the two different styles of sensing, because one tends to favor the reliable and the other one tends to favor the verifiable. So for those that use the what's technically called extroverted sensing, and so these would be all of the SPs, sensor perceivers in the Myers-Briggs system. So the four different types would be ISFP, ESFP, ISTP, and ESTP. They all use a cognitive function that's called extroverted sensing, and we call this sensation. Now, it's very much in the moment. If you think about your five senses or more than your five senses in an extroverted capacity, that means that you are in the moment, in real time, very engaged with your sensory awareness. And this is the style that is favored by people who really want verifiable information, to have a direct interaction with something, to have a direct connection, to be familiar with it directly is generally what is the most interesting to people of this type. Now, if you look at the work of Dario Nardi, who has done a lot of uh, a lot of real deep dive into what is going on with the with the brain as we're using the various cognitive function, says that extroverted sensing has it, whatever is the mental version of what he calls the tennis hop. Now, when you look at professional tennis players. Before the game starts, they get themselves prepared for the game starting by hopping back and forth on their feet. All right. They kind of they don't stand still. They kind of go back and forth, back and forth on their feet in order to be prepared for whichever direction the ball is coming. So they already want to be in motion so that when they're meeting the ball's trajectory, it's much easier to just simply head that direction than to both get into motion and then head that direction. And that's what extroverted sensing or what we call sensation, that's how it's operating all the time. It's always ready for something to to come at it. It's always ready to respond to the outside world, which is why sensation people tend to be some of the most athletic. They tend to be some of the most experiential in their bodies, the most kinesthetic. They're the most adrenaline oriented because sensation is very tied to adrenaline and the part of us that loves to respond in the moment. And it tends to be very much in the here and now because that's how they're perceiving the world. What's going on right this second? It's very real time kinetic. So we see people in positions that are in responsive positions very frequently being sensation, either driver or co-pilot in the car model. A great example of this in a non-athletic or non-performance based is I was actually having a conversation with your dad, Antonia. He's an ESTP in the Myers-Briggs system. So he leads 
with this sensing process, this sensation process. We've nicknamed it sensation. It's technically called extroverted sensing. He was talking about when he was working at a job where his his job was to go into a new town. He worked for like a, um, a hardware store and he was one of their lead marketing, strategic marketing guys. He'd go into a town and they'd say, we want you to determine where the best place to put this store is in this town. And they didn't tell him to go to the town to figure this out. He could have looked at like numbers and metrics off of charts and read reports and looked at traffic patterns from all the data sheets. But what he did is he got in the car, he drove to that town and he would drive up and down the boulevards of a town and he would watch, he'd observe how people drove across the streets. He'd watch at what stoplights people ended up stopping and where they would turn. Then he'd get out and he'd walk the sidewalks up and down the streets to find out the behavior flow of people. He was immersed in the real time experience of the living and breathing town and townspeople to watch how they interacted. And then he would say, I think we need to put a store on this corner. And they'd say, well, the data doesn't really necessarily show that. He said, yes, but I've been on the ground and I've observed people with my eyes, with my senses. I've seen how they interact. And I believe this is the best spot to put it. They'd go, okay. And he was really good at what he did. So they would they would trust him. They'd put the store there and it would do amazing. It would, it would, it would blow away some of the metrics and the numbers that they thought they had on paper because he was on the ground experiencing what people were experiencing in real time. So this is the kind of power that this, this process can bring from like a business standpoint or from a a future pacing standpoint or just seeing how people behave in real time. Yeah, he gets inside individuals. He gets inside their minds by literally observing all of their behavior. And that's such a great... I, I think one of the reasons why I see sensation as a little different than maybe other people do is because of my father, who's an ESTP. I noticed that his... In, like all the things that he did just better than anybody else were things like getting on the ground and observing behavior, watching people's body language. He was excellent in any sort of negotiation situation because he wasn't married to an outcome. He just loved the adrenaline rush of negotiating. So he could out negotiate just about anybody because he just wasn't married to an outcome. He just see what he could get away with. And it was so exciting for him to do that. He was also a chemistry major, which people may not anticipate or expect a sensation person to be super interested in science. Now, he was an ESTP, so he married that sensation process with what we call accuracy, or the technical name is introverted thinking, which loves data points and understanding data. So that was a little unique probably to an ESTP. But regardless of why he went that direction, that was what I observed growing up. And as an ESTP, I think he's such a great example of somebody using the sensation process that isn't necessarily specifically doing athletics or is a first responder in like an emergency situation like rescue. Um, He wasn't a firefighter, although I've known a lot of ESTPs that are ideally suited to being firefighters. So It's really interesting to see the sensation process come up in anything that requires you to be in your body, observing with your senses, figuring things out in real time, directly experiencing a situation and then calling information from that and really understanding how things work by physically being there. Now, the other style of sensing in the cognitive functions is what's called introverted sensing, and we've nicknamed this memory. So it seems that people who favor introverted sensing are ones who focus less on what's verifiable and more on what's reliable. This seems to be very much a safety-oriented process. It very much wants to know how things are done in order to inform how things are going to be done. Now, the reason for this is that when you focus on what's reliable, What is more reliable than a situation that you experienced, that you actually had a direct physical experience with, and then you captured it in order to review it later for its importance, its implications, how what it means to you, etc. Like that is the most reliable information you can get. Something that you directly experienced and then you were able to capture for further review. And this is one of the reasons why we call this process memory. Now, I know that some people have taken exception to us calling introverted sensing memory because it's not about having a good memory. However, it is an information capture system that you end up reviewing later for personal implication. And what is that? Well, that's a memory. (laughs) What you capture and review later is technically a memory. So we call this memory because it is based on a capture system that allows you to review information for its significance. Now, 
it's not always the most reliable piece of information because we are programmed to look at different things. And every person who experience, like if you're in a group of people experiencing something and then you review it later, you're all going to be reviewing slightly different things because you were all wired to look at something different or something different stands out to you as an individual. So what introverted sensing or memory becomes is it's a perceiving process in how you understand the world and take in information and understand what's meaningful, but it's also very skewed to the individual. It's very subjective. What that individual is experiencing personally is absolutely going to inform the information. Yeah, and in introverted sensing memory is used by all the SJ types in the Myers-Briggs system. So ESTJ, ISTJ, ESFJs, and ISFJs will be using this process to perceive the world and learn information. Right, and David Kiersey called those four types the traditionalists. Yeah. And the reason why is because they hearken to past experiences. They hearken to people who have built a lifetime of gathering information and becoming an expert. That's their, those are their primary resources. Those are the people who are the most interesting to them. And those are the situations that are the most interesting because they're very reliable. How do we know how something should be if we're hearkening to a reliable metric? We do that by observing what has already happened. And then we apply whatever principles we can from what already happened to the future. So why is this so important? Why is it so important that people be able to use that memory process? Well, the people who use memory or introverted sensing, they're the ones who make sure that we have protocol. They're the ones that make sure that we have a standard that we can reference back to. And just like we talked about with sensation, and I don't think we even mentioned why sensation is so important, and I'd like to talk about that too, but why is it so important that we have both sensation and memory? Why do we have to have extroverted sensing and introverted sensing? Again, memory or introverted sensing helps us create protocols and standards and helps us maintain what has already been built, which is incredibly important. People like me, I don't care about that. Like, I'm not focused on that. I'm not thinking about maintaining a standard or protocol. Like, I want to blaze new trails. I want to figure out new stuff. But if everybody on the planet was continuing, you know, continually reinventing the wheel then when we go to the tire store to get tires for our car there's like 50 different styles of tires and it and one may or may not fit my car (laughs) but as it is people go do you need 15 inch do you need 16 inch i mean like there's a standard there where now when i go to the tire store to get tires for my car it's not like a three-day process it's like a like a one day i'll pick those and then you can put them on my car super fast because you've done this a million times that's why the memory process is so important And then sensation is super important because we need people who can respond and turn on a dime. We need people who can get in the moment and just react in that in the moment. All we we talk about those early responder rescue units are generally filled with a lot of sensation people. And the reason why is because they can just get super clear in the moment. They're right here, they're right now, they're doing what they need to do. They also teach us where we don't have limitations with our physical bodies and we can push ourselves. Most of the people who have done extraordinary physical feats are people who use the sensation process because they're not satisfied with doing the same old, same old. They want to push their body as an instrument to see how far it can go. So now we have the four minute mile. Now we have people who can literally bend their bodies in half as contortionists. We have people who can like jump out of a helicopter on the top of a black diamond run and then ski all the way to the bottom without killing themselves. It is extraordinary what people who use the sensation process can do. And for the rest of us, it blows the lid off of our self-imposed limitations. When we have limiting beliefs, one of the be- if you're dealing with any limiting belief, I don't care if it's psychological, emotional, or what, and you observe somebody do something incredibly insane with their body, and you're like, how did they even do that? There's a sense of, well, why am I limiting myself? Like, if that person could push themselves to get to that level, why am I not pushing myself to get myself to get as far as I can go? So there are so many lessons to be learned from people who use both the sensation and the memory processes. And you can see how it's incredibly important that the majority of the population use one of these processes. Now, 
of the demographic breakdown, more people favor the memory process over the sensation process. I think it's like a 45-30. So 45% of the population is SJ or using introverted sensing or memory as either a driver or co-pilot process in the car model. And about 30% of the population is using sensation or is an SP in the Myers-Briggs system. And that makes sense, all right? We're gonna need a foundation of traditionalists in order to build all of our innovations upon. We're going to need people who see the importance of maintenancing what we already have and valuing what we already have in order to build on top of that novelty and to go to new places. Like I would, we, you and I would not be able to have a career of teaching people personality typology systems and other models of human development through formats and platforms like podcasts if there were not plenty of people maintenancing the infrastructure we currently have that keeps the digital world going. Like we think of the digital world as the benefit of innovators. Yeah, innovators who built on other platforms that were already existing and being maintained by other people. <laughs> so if we didn't have that maintenance piece, there's no way we could go forward. You have to have an anchor there in order to be able to establish newness. Otherwise, it's just novelty upon novelty and nothing gets folded into the day-to-day experience. I would also say that sensor judges, people who use memory, this introverted sensing process, are also great at helping us hold on to and work with our traditions as people, as culture, as from our from our time that we evolved from tribes into, you know, our current culture today. It's been people that use memory that have held held forth those traditions, have helped us understand who we are as a society, as a culture. They've kept the traditions going. Holidays, I think, are important, and and the different celebrations that different cultures have around the world. It's those memory people that that really appreciate to the to the full degree in order to take that on as almost like the word responsibility is a little a little heavy loaded for that, but they take it on almost with pleasure. Of this is a, tra- a tradition that I would love to pass down to the next generation, and so oftentimes you'll see a lot of memory people, not just in in cultural things like like actual holidays but you'll see a lot of a lot of memory people in the education system helping to educate helping to pass our traditions on to the next generation helping them understand what it's like to be a citizen in our world what does it mean to to think of your neighbor think of the people in your community very community minded people and very traditional people that that want to help us understand ourselves through our connection to each other and our connection to our past and where we came from And that's important. If you have a culture that has lost touch with its past, where it's come from, you have a culture that's untethered and doesn't have a lot of stability, in my in my opinion. And so I think this is very needed in our world, especially as we, you know, we talk about intuitives becoming transformational leaders and changing the world and really and really pushing. And obviously all types can change the world. I mean, memory people are going to be part of this change as well. But memory people are also going to help us remain tied to our past. It's an important tie that we need that if we don't have, we become untethered from, and then we've lost our way as a people. Yeah, all that innovation requires people to absorb it, procedurize it, turn it into a standard. Otherwise, all the innovation just goes away. Like if we don't have somebody who will maintenance the innovation and turn it into the new norm, then it it doesn't stick. That's the sticking, like the stickiness of an idea is whether or not it can get absorbed into the infrastructure and it gets absorbed into the infrastructure by people who use memory and sensation going, yeah, I think that this is worth implementing. I think it's worth absorbing into the culture and then we're going to now manage it. Think about the self-driving car that's being designed right now. There are people, multiple different industries, think Tesla, Google, some other companies are working on developing a self-driving car. When we finally get this technology, we're going to need people that can create standards and procedures and an infrastructure to support a brand new way of transportation that we're all going to not all of us maybe would adopt it right away, but eventually we'll probably have this as part of our lives. We need people that can understand infrastructure, understand how we've traditionally dealt with cars and traffic patterns and all of this to help us craft a world where this has an infrastructure to support it once it becomes a technology that we can use. And so I think this is the kind of stuff we're talking about. It's, it's, it's all part of an ecosystem of talent 
and you as a memory person, if you're listening, are needed in that infrastructural piece because you're you're helping. Like we all have a role to play, and that's the role that tends to be the one you enjoy playing, tends to be the one that you prefer, and so it's needed. And I think that we really appreciate as as in two intuitives talking, we really appreciate the sensors in our lives, the people that have that memory process that are interested in tradition, infrastructure, support structures, precedent, our ties to the past, and also those those sensation people, the ones that are in their bodies, kinesthetic, they're responsive, they can, you know, be very responsive in the moment. I personally, and I think Antonio, I'm not speaking for you, but I believe you also have a lot of appreciation for sensors in the world. I don't I don't have any hostility or any like attitude like all oh, the world's designed for not me, you know, sensor type people. I think it's I think it's perfectly designed for all of us to have a, a a really big role in our cultural infrastructural ecosystem. And I'm really excited about that. It's so important for sensors to vet intuitive innovation. It's so important. I, it can get frustrating as an intuitive when we're like, why, why isn't everybody just seeing how brilliant my ideas are? And it's very easy to get victimy about that. You know, like I come up with all these brilliant ideas and everybody just looks at me and blinks. And I've gotten frustrated by that in the past. I've gotten very frustrated by that. And then at some point it dawned on me, not all of my innovations have been good ideas. And if we don't have a push-pull relationship with innovation, if we don't have people looking at us and blinking, and we don't fight for these innovations, we can't really actually vet them to know whether or not they were a good idea or they were just a good idea inside of our mind. And so having that resistance is actually extremely important so that we don't adopt and institutionalize truly terrible ideas, which we can totally do if we're not careful. So we have to have that vetting process. We have to have that push-pull relationship. And to see it as a service to everybody, not just a villain victim dynamic where, oh, I'm a, I'm the intuitive victim to this sensory villain world. It's really important to appreciate why it's set up the way that it's set up. Sensors, um, I was going to say actually uh, sensation people. Sen- we've been talking a lot about memory people being the people who create these protocols and allow things to get into the institution. And I was thinking as we're talking, sensation people can bring some of that as well. But the other thing I've noticed that they bring is such an extraordinary sense of beauty. There's so much entertainment and so much beauty to be had in people who are using sensation. There is a lot of sensation people that go directly just to performance and wanting, I mean, we talked about, you know, athlete, athletics and performers. That's not all just sensation people. My dad is not a performer or, you know, an athlete. And so obviously it can go a lot of different directions. However, one of the things that sensation people legitimately bring to the world is a sense of performance, entertainment, and beauty. So many of them can do incredible things through art, performance, what, how they're able to manage their bodies. Like there is just a lot to be admired and appreciated there. And what would we be without them? What would we be without that art component and that performance component and that beauty component? There are so many gifts to be had from both of these processes that I don't think that we can actually have a true intuitive awakening, which is our goal at Personality Hacker is to have a massive intuitive awakening. I don't think we can have it as individuals or as a collective if we don't really truly rest into appreciating what sensors bring to the world because they're gonna be part of that infrastructure. They're going to be the ones who look at us with our intuitive awakening and go, hmm, is this something that we should adopt? Is this something that we should pull into the status quo and start thinking in these terms? Is this something that makes sense to me, is verifiable or reliable? They're the ones who are ultimately going to be the foundation of the intuitive awakening because they're going to let us know whether or not they care. So the only way to have them care about us is to really foster a lot of care for them. The only way they can appreciate us is if they're mirroring the appreciation that we have about them. I want to be really clear here. If you are a sensor listening, I don't want to give you the impression that I used the word earlier you know, we talked about intuitives becoming transformational leaders. I don't believe that intuitives are the only ones that can become transformational leaders. I want to be very clear that it didn't sound like you as a sensor aren't capable or even interested in becoming a leader. I believe everyone, and we're really focused on personal growth here at Personality Hacker, not just personality types. We believe intuitives are an underserved segment of the population. We really focus on intuitives, but we really believe you as a sensor also 
have the ability to become a transformational leader. And I just want to make sure I'm very clear that I wasn't saying that that, in, that censors cannot become transformational leaders. In fact, I, I also want to be clear, we don't make a false dichotomy here. Like intuitives are always on the cutting edge and always inventing and always creating and censors are always just following behind and either cleaning up the mess or institutionalizing those innovations. There have been multiple people throughout history that have been censors that have innovated, have brought new ideas to the table, have brought new aspects of how to see the world just as many, you know, just as much as intuitives it's that we have preferences and interests in, in how we show up to the world. And as a trend, we tend to prefer these, these ways of thinking. Not that it excludes intuitives from being those procedural people either. It's just intuitives tend to prefer abstract thought and pushing the envelope and kind of high-minded, almost crazy stuff and invent, invent, inventing things. And sensors tend to trend toward tradition and institution, but does not mean that there's a false dichotomy here. I believe all people have the capability to become leaders. All people have the ability to become innovators and creators. And I think that's important to make sure we're clear about that because you as a censor have that ability to in you. Yeah, your dad, who's an, an ISFP in his 60s, is in some ways more of an early adopter of certain technologies than I am. Oh, yeah. As like, a, you know, a, an ENTP in my 30s, he can adopt technology way faster than I can. Sometimes just because I'm not paying attention, <laughs> I'm in my own world. But I, I was really impressed by how quickly he adopted a lot of technologies that, I mean, he was, what, texting almost immediately. He's been an early adopter of most of the smartphones and, you know, Apple products. And, I mean, it's it's really kind of impressive. So it's not that sensors can't be early adopters. They frequently are. They're the ones who let us know whether or not something is worth being an early adopter for, though. And they're primarily going to be a driving force around technologies. Now, this is a really interesting and important point as well. I feel like one of the reasons why we focus so much on intuitives is that intuitives have a tendency to be more agile when it comes to changes, right? They're not as, they don't, they, they're not as suspicious of changes as sensors have a tendency to be. And so intuitives have a tendency to be a little bit more agile when new things are being thrown at them over and over again. It doesn't completely pull them out of their strengths. It doesn't completely pull them out of, you know, the, the world that they've crafted that feels very safe and verifiable for them. And as technology is, you know, going just at an insane pace, as we're doubling information at ridiculously short amount, you know, amounts of time then there's going to be a strong need for intuitives and people who are intuitive friendly or similar to intuitives in this way, that they're very agile and adopting things very quickly. There's going to be a strong need for intuitives to help guide our path in, you know, in these new technologies. And there's going to be a commensurate need for sensors to, to follow the lead of this agility. It, there's going to be a need for sensors to adopt things quickly, way quick, way quicker than they naturally would, way quicker than their programming and their wiring tells them to do so. And so the relationship between intuitives and center, sensors, the relationship between these two styles is going to need to be a very tight, close relationship. And I think that's one of the reasons why I feel so driven to try to get the sensor intuitive split into the public awareness, into, into the social unconsciousness. It's going to be super important for sensors to understand that things are speeding up and there's nothing we can do about that. Like it is, it's on a trajectory that nobody can stop at this point unless we get thrown back into the stone age with some major world war that like, you know, goes post-apocalyptic we're really not going to be able to stop the prog the rate of progress. It's only going to get faster. And so we need sensors to understand why intuitives are needed right now, where they fit in, how to rely on their agility, and also how to learn to accept and acclimate to the rate of change. And that means that we're going to have to, we're going to have to help sensors on their terms, we're going to have to introduce sensors who might be very uncomfortable with how quickly life is changing. 
I mean, right now, we've, we've talked about it in introvert and extrovert podcasts. The world is so massively over-communicated. But the world is also massively over technologized, if that's a word. Yeah. <laughs> like, we just get thrown into these new technologies over and over and over again. And no wonder there's a sense of like unsettling. No wonder there are so many people who are attaching themselves to maybe some concepts of the glory days of the past. It might actually have nothing to do with how awesome the past was, except that the past was a slower pace of the rate of change. So, in order to actually get us anywhere as people. Intuitives, that agility is going to become more and more and more important. And then for sensors, understanding and appreciating and relying upon that agility is going to become more and more and more important. But sensors are going to have to do it in a smart way. There are definitely not like, like, and when I say intuitives, I don't mean like every intuitive and every sensor. I'm not saying that every sensor needs to follow every intuitive. That's not what I mean at all. I'm talking about like gross overgeneralizations intuitives as a tendency, like as a group, will generally be the ones who trend towards this agility and leading us through, you know, this this rate of change that even baffles me. And sensors as a general rule, as a tendency, as a trend, will have to look to people who are a lot more um, wired to be agile in these rates of change. But sensors are also going to have to be get better and better at vetting who they're going to follow because not every intuitive that is in a position of leadership knows where they're going or has a good calibration. So sensors will need to be better. Like they're right now they vet new technologies just full stop, but they're going to have to get better at vetting intuitive leaders as well and knowing which direction that we're supposed to be going towards. And so that's why it's so important for intuitives and sensors to be in a, in a strong relationship with each other so that sensors can get more and more you know, understanding of how intuition works and why some people may be better to follow than other people, why some technologies may be better to follow than other technologies. And they, it's important that sensors not dig in their heels about change in general, going to a massively, almost regressively conservative space. I don't mean conservative politically. I mean conservative as in like hearkening to the past and locking everything down and wanting to be as, you know, like, like almost to a um, a mimetically ungenerous position, instead of digging in their heels in that way because they believe that culture is getting away from them, as opposed to digging in their heels, having more openness to these, like this new style of engaging with reality and then getting better at knowing who is the right person to follow. And the only way to do that is to have a strong relationship, a strong bridge between the two styles. I think this starts with our narratives, and I think it's already started to some degree. If you look at popular television, we already have seen television series where the main character, and I think this is the first step, I think it can go beyond this, but the main character or main characters often are people who I would determine are intuitives pushing an envelope or pattern recognizing something. And, you know, the, the television show, let's take like Dr. House, the show House about this doctor who I believe is an intuitive in the show. He's playing an intuitive who's pattern recognizing different medical, you know, things that no other doctor can solve in this hospital. And he's the one that's coming up with these aha moments and these in- insights. And some of the infrastructure of the hospital might fight him on it and say, well, this, you know, what do you know? He's a little rogue. And I, so I think this first step, you know, and I think of the other show, uh, popular television show from a few years ago called The Mentalist, where there's an intuitive character pattern recognizing criminals and things this night, or the show Criminal Minds, where you've got intuitive characters leading to figure out what's happening. Uh, and oh, the, um, the most popular one is Doyle's character, uh, Sherlock Holmes. I mean, this is a intuitive leading the charge to pattern recognize stuff. And I think that we, that's our first step, is to see this character in a television show. And so I think there's an appreciation for the pattern recognition that intuitives can bring to the world. And I think a lot of people are very comfortable with their, that, being on a television program. I think on a macro level, like that idea of having people that are out there that can figure out solutions that maybe the status quo can't figure out, you know, really train, highly trained professionals that may think outside the box. It's great on TV, but I think the next step is to say, okay, I'm okay with that in my life. I'm okay that I live in this small town and there's this crazy man in my town hall meeting talking about how we could do this one thing to reduce crime by letting kids skateboard around the courthouse. But we all know that that's going to cause damage and you're like, or whatever uh, that might 
not be how we've always run things around this town. This guy's crazy. Let's marginalize him and push him away. He must not know what he's talking about because that's not the tradition we've had in this town. That'll just get kids into trouble. Whereas, stop for a minute and say, this guy that's proposing this idea of maybe a skate park near the courthouse, skateboarding near the courthouse, maybe that would actually help kids stay out of trouble. Maybe that's a, a way to give them something to do. And this new idea that's brought to the table, don't just reject it because it's out of the norm. It's something it hasn't had precedent for in your little small town. But maybe you could listen to that. In a television show, this guy would probably be a hero that's brought some solution to the town. But in your real life, how do you interact with the people that may have some, what you might consider, quote unquote, crazy ideas? And I'm not saying, again, that you should just adopt every crazy idea. That would be stupid and silly and and not very careful thinking. But allow some space for this in your actual life, if you're a censor listening. Allow some space for this, not just on television with these popular characters, but people that you interact with every day, people in your family, friends of yours, people at your work, people in your community. There are ideas that they're proposing that seem like they would go against precedent, they would go against the status quo and what's always been done, and it it may even sound very counterintuitive to some degree. But start paying attention to those those outlier voices, because I think there's some wisdom there that that all of us can learn from. And again, I think that working together like Antonio's talking about is really the secret here. So I think that's just some ideas to a narrative that I'm casting to start putting your mind around how this stuff interplays with each other. Well, and on the other side, it, the advice isn't just to censors to open themselves up to intuitives. The advice really also is intuitives get better at speaking censor language. There is so much wisdom to be had there. There's so much to appreciate about censors. And if you have an attitude, then the way you present your ideas, it's going to reflect that attitude. So again, learning to appreciate what they bring to the table, learning to appreciate that your counterintuitive idea or your highly intuitive idea, which is more likely, may actually not be a very good one. (laughs) And just because, you know, like that whole don't believe everything you think, just because you're coming up with something novel, it doesn't necessarily play out the way that you think it's going to. And it might truly need to be vetted. So learning a massive appreciation for what sensors bring is a great way to, you know, to have your ideas and your communication reflect that appreciation of what they're doing for you. Now, another thing to remember, again, is what we mentioned earlier, which is not every sensor believes that the world is built for them. And that's legitimate. We are all individuals. Every single person is bringing an individual experience. There's the, the I would say that the personality type that is most represented in a demographic breakdown is, I, is the ISFJ personality type. But if you've met a handful of ISFJs, you know that each one of these people is completely different, all right? And especially since they're leading with that process of introverted sensing or what we call memory, remember that's super subjective. And so there's a quirkiness that comes along with people of this type that is very individual to them and their experiences and what they grow up with and what is... The the word tradition might make us think of one specific tradition, but the truth is, is that we all have different cultural traditions based on our families, based on the things that, you know, we grew up with. And so it's not like every ISFJ is an ISFJ. They're all going to be very quirky and very individualistic. And so really appreciating the flavors of these types, recognizing that, you know, yeah, ESTJs are probably all going to show up in a way that looks very industrious, right? They're going to be hard workers and they're going to do a lot of stuff. But not every ESTJ is just like every other ESTJ. So just like we want to be honored for our individuality and honored for our differences and honored for how we show up, the same thing applies for sensors. Every person of each sensing type is going to be a unique individual and they're all going to come with something a little different. They're all going to come with their own unique skills and talents. How they've chosen to focus their attention is going to inform their individuality and their personal expression. And they may have grown up in a context that makes them feel very disenfranchised. They may have grown up in a context that makes them feel very unique and individual from everybody else, especially types like ISFPs, um, especially types like the, you know, the introverts that are sensors they're not gonna necessarily believe that the world is designed for them. And they may be right. Their current context might not be fueling their needs. And so recognizing that that sense, like we, that that phrase, the more personal an experience, the more universal it is, 
That doesn't apply to just any specific personality type. That is an overarching statement about humanity. So if we're feeling like we're disenfranchised or marginalized, just because somebody's a censor doesn't mean that they've never experienced that feeling. And we can connect and communicate on that level, recognizing that we all need to be acknowledged for who we are as individuals and honored for what we bring to the table, even if what we bring to the table is something very you know, different than what somebody else brings to the table. One more thing that I'd like to mention before we wrap all of this up is that these cognitive functions aren't in a vacuum, all right? They're not just individual things that have no relationship to each other. In particular, when you look at the perceiving functions, so there's four perceiving functions. We talked about introverted and extroverted intuition and introverted and extroverted sensing. They are what are called polarities of each other. They're they're not dichotomies. They're not opposites. They're more like, they're more like, uh, to, like a comet with a tail at the end. So if you're an intuitive, you have sensing processes within you. You have an ability to engage in the sensing realm. And that applies for sensors as well. If you're a sensor, you have an intuitive part of you. Now, it's not the thing you're focused on, so you don't build as much skill in it, and it might be something that's scary or uncomfortable, but it is inside of you. So whenever you're trying to reconcile the other side, whenever you're trying to figure out, if you're an intuitive and you're trying to figure out how sensors operate, if you're a sensor and you're trying to figure out how intuitives operate, one of the best ways to do it is to visit that part of you, even if it's a really immature or unsophisticated or just tiny little part of who you are, understand that that part is where other people live. That's their full experience. So let's say you're using introverted intuition or what we call perspectives. The polarity of introverted intuition is extroverted sensing. That makes sense, right? It's the opposite or what we call sensation. So if you're using the perspectives process, Anytime you're inside your body, anytime you're really getting in touch with that kinesthetic piece of you and you're in the moment and in the experience, you're experiencing what it's like to be an SP. And for those of you who are SPs using sensation, anytime you just get that moment of like you think you know what's going on or you're having an aha, or even if you're a little paranoid because you think something is about to happen to you or you're like fearing for the future or future pacing, you're in the perspectives process. So you can understand what it would be like to be the other side, and you can understand and appreciate how both of those things need to be represented. That's our mind-body connection. Those two places are how we get in touch with what's going on inside our minds and what's going on going on inside our bodies, regardless of our type. So understand that the polarity there is how we get in touch with the other side and kind of understand how the other side lives. On the flip is introvert, or excuse me, introverted sensing, what we call memory, and extroverted intuition, or what we call exploration. Those are polarities. So if you're an NP or an SJ, and you want to understand what it's like to be the other side, if you're an SJ, just simply ask yourself about those moments when you kind of feel adventurous, or you want to try something new, or you get a sense of wanting to create something new in the outside environment. You're getting into your exploration process. That's what it feels like. And some people live there all the time. And if you're an NP and you want to know what it's like to be an SJ, get inside that introverted sensing and that memory process. That's the part of you that revisits the past or gets a little bit of R&R by, you know, getting into nostalgia or something that is like a comfort to you, getting inside a safety feeling or a comfort feeling. That's what it's like to be an SJ. And so... We need both of those components. That's the part of us that understands wh- why it's important to have infrastructure. And that's those are also that polarity represents what it why it's important to blaze new trails and get something new handled. So we all have all of this inside us. And it's just a matter of accessing those different components to go, I don't really understand what it's like to have this as a strength or as a major talent, but I do understand what it's like to use it. So now how can I imagine what it would be like to be living here all the time? And how can I imagine what it would be like to have this be my comfort zone or my flow state or the thing that I want to be doing? And if you can really perspective shift and really try to get inside that other process, it'll be much easier for you to start appreciating why this thing needs to be there because you're utilizing it too. And 
you know, it doesn't matter whether you're sensor and intuitive. We all have all of this inside of us and, and, and we need all of it. All of this needs to be represented. And these are bridges. Once again, these are, we're trying to build bridges between these two sides. It's so important for us to build these bridges and really meet each other in each other's sandboxes to understand the full human experience. If you're a new listener, Personality Hacker attracts people like yourself that are interested in personal growth, growing yourself as a person. And we believe firmly that understanding some of these concepts around sensing, around intuition, around how we show up as our individual personality types is one of the first and best lenses to begin a personal growth and personal development journey. We don't talk about personality types just because we want to talk about them. We believe that personality types are one of the best ways for you whatever type you are, to begin down the road of personal growth. And so we encourage you to come over and be part of this conversation, this discussion. This is a discussion starter. We want to hear from you. I want to hear your voice. Come over to personalityhacker.com. You can leave a comment or ask a question right below this podcast and be a part of this community, be a part of this discussion. We, We really want your voice part of this. And it doesn't matter whether you're sensor, intuitive. I don't care what type you are. If you have an interest in growing yourself and this is interesting to you, come over and be a part of it. We also have a Facebook page group, a lot of different stuff on Facebook. The best place to start is facebook.com forward slash personality hacker. We've got a link there to our intuitive awakening group. If you are an intuitive or you have intuitive sensibilities, even if you're a sensor, you're welcome to join. All you have to do is apply. There's like a little uh, sticky uh, thing on that page that you can click on and then come over and join that group, intuitive awakening group, and be a part of the community that we're building there of like minds. You also might want to go to facebook.com forward slash intuitive awakening is actually the page that you'd get to that group from, not just the main personality hacker page. So come over and be a part of the community. We invite you to do that. We invite you, if you've got an interest in personal growth, that's the type of people you'll be surrounded by in this community that's growing every day. We're getting new and new and more people joining constantly. Yeah, you can also subscribe to us on iTunes and various Android platforms. We have a Personality Hacker app where you can listen to our podcast through Android platforms very easily, which is awesome because we kept getting questions about how to subscribe through Android. If you want to leave a rating and review, though, iTunes is still the best place to do it iTunes is dominating the podcast world, and the more ratings and reviews we can get through iTunes, the more precedent they will give us, or preference they will give us in putting us up on iTunes charts and, you know, promoting us on their iTunes page. And so if you have a sense of reciprocity and you want to give back, you enjoy our podcast and you've subscribed, please feel free to leave a rating and review because that really helps us out. You can also find us at twitter.com forward slash personality hack. And of course, come over and take our personality test if you haven't done that over at personalityhacker.com. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. We can't wait to talk with you on the next Personality Hacker podcast. Podcast.